Well, uh, this certainly was, um... Um... What exactly is this, anyway? Well, the title, as you can plainly see, is called Rockman and Fork. But over here in the States, what we'd like to do is call this game Mega Man and Bass. Is it a bass? The game was a spin-off of the main line of Mega Man games. No, it was not Mega Man 9, that would not come till many years later. But it is easy to see why many people could have been confused with this one. But the most strange thing about this one is the fact that this game came out in Japan on the Super Famicom in 1998. That would be like if a new game came out today for the PS2. So why did this game that came out after Mega Man 8 skip back a console generation? Well, according to then Mega Man producer Kiji Inafune, this decision was made for the audience who still had the Super Famicom and could not afford the newer PlayStation or Sega Saturn. Hey, don't look at us, that wasn't our decision. Another thing about this game is that it has a certain type of representation, as many see it as the low point of the entire Mega Man series. Yeah, and this is mainly due to the difficulty alone, as many see this game as going way overboard with its level designs to the point that it was just way too unfair. Yeah, before Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, this was the game that was infuriating people with its difficulty. But the real question is, does this game really warrant all the negative criticism that it's been getting? I don't know. I mean, really, absolute worst of the Mega Man franchise? Are, are we really going there? Well, let's put this game under the microscope and see just for ourselves. So, right off the bat, one big thing that makes this game different from other Mega Man games is that you have a player select. You can choose to go into battle with either Mega Man or Bass. Now, for this review, me and Gene decided to split up our efforts. I'll take Mega Man, while I will play as Bass. So we will see what each character brings to the table. First up is the Blue Bomber. First thing of note is that by and large, the game is ultimately the same no matter who you choose to play as. The levels you progress through will not be any different, nor will the recommended order of bosses you run into. The only differences in the stages is that some of them will have optional alternative routes that either Mega Man or Bass can access. You will hear more about Bass's abilities later with Jane at the helm, but one example is that Mega Man naturally has the slide ability from his previous outings, allowing him to enter narrow areas that Bass physically cannot. Now, aside from creating some minor differences so that each character can experience a little something different, the main reason for this was to technically ensure that both characters would at some point be played. Throughout the entire game, you will run into these CDs that are scattered and placed in unique locations that, again, either Mega Man will be able to reach with his particular abilities, and likewise with Bass. Despite who you play as, all the collectible CDs can be seen by both players, excluding the ones that you've already obtained. So if you see one as Mega Man, but realize that it's beyond your reach due to the obstacle, you'll either have to come back later with the right enhancement, or approach it differently with Bass in his playthrough. With Mega Man 8 being the exception, Mega Man and Bass is one of the first classic games in the series to support a save feature and not have any options for passwords. By saving your progress as each character, this is how the game will keep track of all the collectibles you've obtained. As for what the CDs do, sad to say, it's not too much, but if you collect them all, you can view each one in the hub screen to see some detailed information about some of Mega Man's rogues gallery. Hey, if you're a completionist and enthusiast, it's pretty cool as it gives you something beyond the campaign to do. But it's not necessary to finish the game. Speaking of which, let's get started and talk about Mega Man's portion of the story. One whole year after the events of Mega Man 8, a robot named King suddenly ransacks Dr. Wily's lair and the robot museum, stealing the data CDs mentioned before. Mega Man arrives at the scene to stop him, but notices Proto Man got there first. This is where we get our first piece of exposition. King's plan is to create a utopia just for robots so that they can rule over humankind, essentially making them slaves. Naturally, Proto Man attempts to stop him, but King cut the fight short and uh, bolted. Mega Man tells Proto Man to back off and get patched up while we take care of King. None too eager to back down, King escapes leaving a boss for us to deal with, and <laughs> so boy, it's the Yellow Devil from Mega Man 8. And wow, he's just as easy. Yeah, I don't know why, but the Yellow Devil has definitely dropped down from the formidable foe he uh, used to be. I guess he's a little green these days. So after fighting your way through eight Robot Masters, Mega Man confronts King for a second time with Proto Man coming to help to make the fight, you know, winnable. Using up all his energy to do so, Proto Man is down for the count once again, leaving just King. 
One fight later, King opens up about his backstory and that he was taught that robots shouldn't fight for the sake of humans, and that his master is none other than, get this, Dr. Wily. Because if you had any hope that a Mega Man game was going to star a villain other than Wily, then you're giving these writers too much credit. So yeah, it turns out Wily secretly instilled these plans into King so he could concoct a new scheme to desperately try to get rid of Mega Man, among other things. After forcing King against his will to fight Mega Man once again, the self-destruct sequence initiates on King's fortress, forcing Mega Man to leave King behind. Naturally, Mega Man then confronts Wily head on, and once again, the old man is defeated, and we can only assume is taken back to jail. Mega Man back home is greeted with open arms, but he's depressed wondering if King managed to make it out okay. Short answer, yes he did. Somehow. But never again in the series is he ever mentioned so kind of pointlessly tacked on. He really might as well be dead. Alright, so with that interesting story out of the way, what are we dealing with here in terms of gameplay? Well, if you're at all a Mega Man fan, you already probably know this game has a reputation for being a ball buster. To be fair, the only real reason I think this is suggested amongst Mega Man fans is that under usual circumstances, Mega Man by and large is a run and gun with platforming sprinkled in. There can be tricky sections and obstacles, sure, but usually the game cleverly has easy ways around them so you don't necessarily have to do them that much. The Mega Man games in terms of challenge are usually so-so because of this, with the only real threat being the boss of the stage. Unless you figured out the pattern nor have the enemy's weaknesses guaranteeing you a win, you will die a few times for sure, but with very little trial and error, victory is practically assured. Mega Man and Bass, in my opinion, because of it, is rather unique in its foundation and has to change the game up to be more strategic so that both characters are utilized in a way that the player may need to do a little thinking when traversing obstacles and planning on which foe to take on. The game because of this can be quite difficult, and I'm not gonna say every obstacle you face is a fair one. There are definitely moments that will catch you by surprise, and if you don't have the quickest reflexes, we'll guarantee a death, but they aren't stupid hard to avoid or see coming either. Mega Man's Mega Buster still packs the punch we're used to and gets the job done pretty easily, especially with the charge shot. Going back to the rules of Mega Man games, before 8 once again, Mega Man can form bolts off of enemies and use these to purchase upgrades in Auto Shop. As you progress through the game, more upgrades will become available, and yes, I do highly recommend buying a few of these as soon as you get the option, as it will make the experience of the game easier to get a handle on if things are getting a little too crazy. The damage multiplier is definitely a must-have. When equipped, it will heavily increase the damage of your buster gun with the more damage you've taken. I call this the last resort, as it can drain a boss's health meter by a quarter if not more when you're at death's door. Not to mention, mow down regular enemies with a single shot. The barrier ability is obviously a good one, as it gives Mega Man an added defense. The high speed charger, which does exactly what you think it does. Beat the bird, which will drop a defense ball on you, making you invincible as long as the shield lasts and auto-recover, which by standing still for about a minute or so will completely refill Mega Man's health. It is fully possible to play and beat this game without the upgrades if you are skilled enough, but the option is there and does help keep things moving along. The level design by many has often been considered pretty weak, especially when you play as Mega Man, because it feels like it was made to be catered towards Bass's natural abilities more than Mega Man's, and Mega Man as a character feels thrown in as an afterthought. I'm afraid I can't agree. Sure, Bass has more abilities than the Blue Bomber, making exploration a little easier, but this doesn't mean that Mega Man has any more or less of a challenge getting through areas. And again, some of these areas Bass can't even reach, period. With Mega Man, there's usually always a way to approach a problem. Are there leaps of faith to be taken with Mega Man in a stage? There can be, but there doesn't have to be. These stages usually have alternative pathways, and depending if you take advantage of enemies' weaponry, you might find more of a competent method. Honestly, I don't think since Mega Man 1 on the NES has a Mega Man game encouraged and forced a player to get wise to the fact that you will be using those extra weapons. The Ice Wall, for example, is very useful because it acts as a pillar that you can jump on for more height and platform to stand on so you can cross otherwise deadly traps. On rare occasions, I can see some of the enemy placements being a little obnoxious, and I'm sure the game wants me in some way to figure out how to use whatever arsenal I can get 
to, you know, progress. And while that probably will work out, for me, sometimes it's just easier to take the hit and quickly use my invincibility frames to get by. One thing Mega Man definitely has over Bass is his natural raw power. While Bass may be more agile, Mega Man makes up for the lack of mobility just by having a far easier time dealing with enemies and bosses. His regular lemon shot is adequate enough to deal with most, and the charge shot is pretty devastating on bosses if it connects. Sure, Mega Man's defense may be on par with Bass's, where player skill is going to still be a requirement to get out of the way since bosses are definitely quick. However, they can still be beaten with little trouble once you understand how they work. Cold Man is the obvious first choice because without question he is the easiest one to defeat. However, with Mega Man I'd say you should have little trouble with whatever choice you pick, just because he can dish out the pain better. Add some fast reflexes and you'll probably have this game down. Another neat feature this Mega Man game has with its bosses that others don't really is that some of them require that strategy that I mentioned before to take down. Even if you have a boss's weakness, this doesn't guarantee you a win like in other games. Some foes, like Burner Man, need some setup. His arena has two spike pits on the side. The idea is to summon the ice wall and time it just right so that you can push the frozen block into him, knocking his ass into the spike pit for a real dent in his health bar. Otherwise, the ice pillar alone won't do too much. It can be tricky to do, as he's not just going to stand there the whole match and let you do this to him, but it's up to you to make that call or to just fight him with your buster. Either way, it works. Probably the most infamous stage to mention are, of course, the King's Fortress levels. The first stage isn't too bad no matter who you pick, but the boss of the stage does have a cheap shot if you're not careful. So yeah, be sure to get off that platform as soon as he dies, otherwise it's double KO and eh, that's no fun. King's Fortress 2. This stage will definitely put you through the ringer, as it's a long stage, and if you run out of continues at any point, you are going to be doing this one all over again. This stage also sports four boss fights, two of which are king during the climax. On your way there, you'll run into this tank mini-boss that at first seems harder than he is, but with some carefully placed mines and buster shots to the front and back, this thing will go down pretty easily. The second sub-fight is likely the one that you are very familiar with. Even if you haven't played it, I'm willing to bet that you've watched a YouTuber or two who has probably demonstrated this fight to you and just how Mega Man specifically, this fight is unfair. Um, <laughs> look guys, at the end of the day, it's all a matter of opinion and you know what, here's mine. This fight is not that hard, even with Mega Man. Yes, I do think the fight tends to drag out a little too long, but really, that can be remedied if you are using the right power-ups. Still, I know you're probably thinking, what about the freaking fist attack? The one that destroys platforms which screws Mega Man outright? Okay look, I can't speak for other players out there. Either they have some insanely bad luck, or they just aren't that good at Mega Man games. I don't know, but in my experience, it's very rare that the fist attack will ever put Mega Man in a position where he is completely incapable of making a jump to a nearby platform. Don't get me wrong, it's very possible, and it has happened to me maybe two or three times in the past, but most of the time, even when the fist attack destroys some of the platforms, the stage is always auto-scrolling forward, and when Mega Man is jumping forward, he's getting more reach in the air than you may realize, meaning there's a very good chance he can still and will reach the other platforms as they are spawning. Aside from tripping you up, this boss doesn't have many alternative ways to harm you either. Yes, the flashing lights for some can be problematic, but hey, you really should be able to easily mentally process what the platforms are, even with the light. Really, when it comes to strategy with this sub-boss, the best advice I could give is to end the fight as quickly as possible, and one way you can do that is to purposefully take enough damage so that you can benefit from that damage multiplier. Bear in mind, this is just one of several options, but it's one that definitely works. You will be surprised how fast you can wreck this thing before it becomes a threat just with the damage boost. Also, if for some reason you are having trouble with this fight, the respawn point literally has a free 1-up stationed permanently nearby so you will never have to worry about wasting lives on this thing. Again, I can understand, but I seriously do not believe this boss is as nearly as difficult as other players would like to make it out to be. When you get to the end, you will face King in all his glory. He's far less of a challenge than the previous bosses, so really if you got this far it's unlikely you're going to die here. The final stage, which is the Wily Fortress, is actually a really cool stage, modeled much like after Mega Man X's final stage in the first game. I like how it plays like one big level with the eight robot masters sprinkled in like a gauntlet of sorts. 
In my experience with Mega Man games, I always groaned inside of annoyance when I got to the end of the game because it meant just doing a boss rush. But I like it when they build a stage around the bosses and you work your way to each one in between. Mega Man X did it great, and I think it sucks that they haven't really done that since. Admittedly, this stage can also be the most challenging, as it should be since it's the final stage, but really the best way to do it is just to do it. And save as much power-ups as you can. Use the upgrades to your advantage and swap them out when you need to, and with the right skill and perseverance, Dr. Wily should go down. Phew! Now, even though I've been kind, I will come out and say that this Mega Man game definitely doesn't hold back its punches. It is a step up from just about every game previous, and does put your skills to the test, forcing you to take advantage of all your skills and upgrades, and to use them in creative ways. It's very clear that not many care for this style of gameplay, and that's fine. It's an acquired taste, but as far as I'm concerned, Mega Man plays just fine, and doesn't feel at all like he's at a disadvantage. Alright Gene, take it away and show us what Bass can do. So now we come to Bass, or Bass, or whatever. For his moveset, he can do something that we Mega Man fans have been asking for for years and years. He can shoot in multiple directions, A to be exact. However, the trade-off is that his initial blasts are weaker as compared to Mega Man. But you can upgrade it through Otto's Workshop. There's also some callbacks to the Mega Man X series, as Bass has both the double jump and quick dash. What this does, it gives Bass more maneuverability than his counterpart. Also, lacking a slide ability means that he cannot get through tight spaces and will have to make his way around some other areas. Some people suggest that this is more of a Bass game as he can get around a little easier, but we do not necessarily agree with that. We feel that you can still get through the stages with either one, as it does feel like a fair trade-off. Now, Mega Man has a bit more power and the more traditional means, while Bass has the more X-style maneuvers and is definitely not as strong. In the end, it all bounces out. So the story for Bass is that, well, he's basically trying to prove how strong he is by taking out King. After watching Proto Man get sliced in half, he goes forward to carve out his own legend, as it were. The game maintains the same structure as it did for Mega Man, as you make your way through the eight robot masters. You can visit Otto's shop and obtain several discs for more information. Now, like Mega Man, Bass can also obtain the Robot Master's special power-ups that he can use for extra help during stages and during battles with other bosses. The thing is though, I do find that the powers seem to be really uneven, as some can help you get past the Robot Masters more quickly, while others only do a bit more damage. Standing toe-to-toe -to -toe and kicking each other in the dick to one of you guys fall may not be the most sufficient way to do things, and there's a good chance they might still destroy you before you get them, so dodging and weaving is still the best way to go. Now on a personal note, however, I'm not sure how I feel about Bass also possessing the copy ability. Now I understand that if he did not, it would be a very different game for Mega Man, so I do get it, but I, I don't know, I just feel that Bass having this also makes Rock feel a little less special, you know? But on the other hand, I suppose Wily would give him this function to even the odds, so, well, whatever. Speaking of function, one thing that you can buy in Otto's shop is the ability to fuse with trouble. This will allow Bass to fly for a period of time while firing shots in three different directions. But to be honest, I really never found it to be all that great of a use. Hell, I even forgot that I had it most of the time, and when I did, eh, it wasn't all that great. You know, for my liking, I found that the other tools in auto shops were more helpful, particularly the buster upgrades. Yeah, if it's not clear by now, Bass Buster damage is unbelievably sad. Sure, he can get around and do all this crazy stuff, but it's sure going to take you a hell of a lot longer to defeat enemies with it. After taking care of the A-Robo Masters, Bass goes through King's Fortress, defeating the tank and jet bosses before facing King down again. Bass gets some help from Proto Man with Hyper Fist, and Bass then takes him down. King questions as to why he chooses to side with humans, and Bass reminds him that humans are their creators. A bit out of character for Bass, I think. And then, just like with the Mega Man story, we find out that Dr. Wily was behind the whole thing. After Bass defeats King's second form, it's off to Wily's castle. Through the eight robot masters again, and Bass faces his creator and... Whoa, Bass! Now that is more in character! 
I don't know if this is the correct translation or just some funny business with this version of the game, but either way, it was pretty awesome. Anyway, Bass takes care of Dr. Wily, and then the good doctor gives his explanation on why he did this to Bass. Oh, he just wanted Bass to prove that he was the strongest because Dr. Wily always believed in him. What a load of... Right, Bass, yeah, I agree. Proto Man shows up and destroys Dr. Wily's plans for a King Model 2 and then leaves. With Bass vowing one day to take Mega Man's life with his own hands. Yeah, that story is pretty stupid. <laughs> Now, this is not to say that the game is a cakewalk. We do acknowledge that this game has some very difficult patches, and it can be very frustrating to be moving along pretty well, only to have your progress halted by a very difficult spot or boss fight. But the thing is, and this is coming from me, and I do admit I'm not very good at Mega Man games personally, I still found ways to get around them. Now, for example, I'm not bragging here, but I was able to beat the Jet Boss on my first try. Will was my witness. It just takes some patience and eventually it can be done. Now, I would not recommend this game to Mega Man newbies as your first Mega Man game, but I do not feel this game is such a steep in difficulty as compared to many others in the series. Yeah, no joke. It's a difficult game, but we can't in good conscience say that it's up there with really tough games like Ghosts and Goblins or Ninja Gaidens or hell, even the Castlevania games. Mega Man and Bass gives you plenty of options to take advantage of when approaching any obstacle. Some are easier than others, but it's up to you to figure out what works best. It's hard, but it's not unfair. How about that music? Well, this is another thing that translated very well, as Mega Man Bass has some very serviceable music. And here are some examples. grow up with Mega Man and Bass, the game did eventually become one of my favorites of the series. Sure, its story is not that compelling, but to be fair, story isn't exactly what we sign up for when it comes to the Blue Bomber and his adventures. Gameplay is what always takes precedence, and I, as a longtime Mega Man fan, actually appreciated the challenge and ideas this game brought to the table. Sure, I did miss some of those more well-known power-ups like the Rush Jet and the Rush Coil, but considering what this game has in its place, is sufficient enough to help you out in the long run. The invisible blocks I didn't find to be nearly as problematic as in past Mega Man games, which never really mattered because there were always ways to get around them. Also, you have two playable characters with unique playstyles. That had never been done in a Mega Man game before, and it was a welcome change that added so much replay value. Mega Man and Bass was truly an ambitious game that brought a lot of new ideas to the table. And sadly, for a long time, it was technically the last real Mega Man outing we would see for years to come. Sure, there would be some other smaller games here and there, like the Mega Man and Bass sequel on the Wonder Swan. What the hell is that? Exactly. But really, it wouldn't be until 10 years later when the original Mega Man would see another console release. Unofficially, many fans considered Mega Man and Bass to be Mega Man 9. But a decade later, we would learn that this was not the case. Well, there you guys have it. Mega Man and Bass. I like the game. So do I. Well, that pretty much confirms it. People just suck at this game. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for joining us. Um, so, that's our opinion of it. I'm Eugene Morris. I'm William Morris. Leave a like, comment, subscribe, and we will see you on whatever the hell we decide to review next. I don't know. Well, if excuse me, I'm going to turn on the air conditioning because it's hot as balls. Oh, yeah. Hey there everyone, did you like this video? If you did, why not give us a thumbs up and maybe leave a comment and watch some more of our stuff. Also, if you really want to keep up with the Brotherhood of Gaming, such as myself, William Morris, or Eugene, you should really follow us on our Twitters, links provided below, so you can see what's coming up in the future. And since, you know, we have to play these games sometimes and record them, why not join us on our Twitch page where you can hang out with all of us as we do so and chit chat about the games that we love so much. 
Lastly, if you want to help keep our dreams alive, you can support us in any number of ways, either by continuing to view our videos, like them, share them with all your friends and family and your peeps and your girlfriends, or you can also join our small Patreon and throw all your spare cash away. We'll even give you a shout out. Once again, thank you all and have a wonderful day.